and, uh, and these strategies would be carried out through a host of machinations such as those that are laid out if you're interested in books like After the Ball. In the past decade and a half, no more than that, the creation of same-sex marriage became one of the central strategies in this program, a remarkably successful one that has leaned very heavily indeed on human rights, or in particular civil rights discourse. Now, there is an affinity between the personal liberty or autonomy argument for same-sex marriage and the rights argument, but there's also a certain tension between them. The rights argument seeks access to the institution called marriage. The autonomy argument, however, points, as we saw with Kuntz, to the deregulation of sexual relations generally and the demise of such institutions as marriage. Why is marriage for people of opposite sex? Why is marriage for life? Why is it to the exclusion of all others? Why for just two persons? Why is it only for adults? Why should siblings be excluded? So long as maybe they commit to not reproducing, or at least not reproducing until we have the technology in place to fix any genetic problems that might result. Perhaps, some say, we should just make contract law flexible enough to serve and protect partners in various configurations and introduce a new reproduction license for people who intend to have children and then abolish marriage law altogether. That or something like it is what the people at beyondmarriage.net think. There are many signatories to that. I don't know if anybody's looked at that statement, but many prominent signatories to it. And as I said, Kuntz's line of thought also runs in that direction towards the end of marriage as a public institution. Well, there are, of course, counter-arguments to be made. Let's take the rights argument first. In a piece entitled Rights and Recognition, which is contained in the book that Daniel Siri and I produced uh, with some other scholars from across Canada called Divorcing Marriage, I pointed out that the rights or anti-discrimination argument is really a shell game. As the Universal Declaration of Human Rights declares, everyone has the right to marry and found a family. That's Article 16 of the Universal Declaration. Presuming, of course, that someone of the opposite sex is willing to marry them and that the two of them prove fertile, otherwise their right to found a family won't actually emerge into reality. Is it discrimination to say that someone in that the someone in question must be someone of the opposite sex? I say it's not discrimination at all. Marriage, so defined, remains open to all. Some people aren't interested. Others have higher priorities. Fine. There's no law that says everyone must marry. When does it become discriminatory, though, to say that only people of opposite sex can be married? Well, it becomes discriminatory precisely and only when you redefine marriage as the union of two persons. In other words, once you've changed the definition to make it gender neutral, you can't forbid any subclass of persons from marrying without improperly discriminating against them. That's clear. But that's not the case before you change the definition. It's fallacious to argue that we must change the definition to prevent discrimination when discrimination is only possible after we've changed the definition and the law. Now, 
Maybe you need to ponder on that argument a little bit and then ask you the question if you're during the Q&A. Uh, happy to uh, go over it with you. The only case same-sex marriage proponents can make with integrity here, as far as I can see, is the case for jealousy. Now, remember what I said at the beginning. This is not intended to be ad hominem, and I don't actually even mean what I just said in a pejorative way. I do mean it, but I don't mean it in a pejorative way. I'll explain. We don't want to marry, but we want the honor and dignity that goes with marriage. So, we'll redefine marriage to make it over into something that we might or do want. I understand that. But once we recognize that that's really what's going on here, the personal liberty argument falls away along with the rights argument. There already is personal liberty. One doesn't have to marry. These days, one doesn't have to pretend not to be homosexually inclined either. One doesn't even have to pretend not to be polyamorous. We're still debating whether one has to pretend not to be a pedophile in inclination, okay? Still criminal in that sort of activity. Uh, pedophilia, according to Dan Markison, spokesman for the 100-member uh, Danish Pedophile Association, which was founded in 1985, about four years before Denmark introduced uh, legal same-sex uh, partnerships. Pedophilia, says Markson, and I quote, has all the same characteristics as homosexuality, transvestism, and fetishism, etc. Sexual orientation is defined as lifelong attraction, which pedophilia obviously is. End quote. And similar things could, of course, be said of, of pedophilia. Yet doesn't marriage, understood as the union of one man and one woman, tell people how to love? Must we not at least grant that objection here? Well, of course it does. It sets a standard, no doubt about it. There is, in that sense, a case for jealousy. Marriage serves in our society as a standard of the kind of sexual con uh, conduct and the kind of relationship that we admire and respect and uphold as, as a model. But let's ask ourselves the question, why does marriage tell people how to love? And what does it tell them? Granted that we are free in our society to have other kinds of orientations and indeed to engage in other kinds of practices. Should we have a model that upholds a particular kind of practice? Let's consider the case for that. The simplest answer is that marriage tells people how to love for the sake of the children they produce. Marriage like virginity, is an institution, that is virginity practiced as a, as a chosen mother of one, is an institution of restraint. And the restraint in question is a discipline designed to produce the healthiest possible context for raising children. That marriage does much good for adults is not to be denied. Or that marriage has unitive dimensions which especially concern the adults. That that marriage is open sacramentally to a higher and mystical truth, a redemptive and perfected truth, is also true. Arguably, in fact, uh, well, I mean, arguably I would say, it's the sacramental dimension of marriage introduced by Christianity that has so raised the stakes in marriage as to make it an object of jealousy. But marriage tells people how to love primarily for the sake of the children they produce. Marriage is the only institution we have that formally commits adults to the care and nurture of their children. Or at least it used to be, until we redefined it as a union of two persons. A union that is not in principle generative. A union that in a principled way excludes generativity and children from its purview, a union that is merely a matter of adult intimacy. Now, lots of folk have undertaken to develop this line of argument. Sex makes babies, as Maggie Gallagher likes to remind us. 